At the heart of the most popular computing platforms in history, we will always find great hardware. Welcome to Chip Wars. In Chip Wars, we review the hardware that's behind some of the most powerful and popular platforms in the world today. Hardware always defines what the software can actually do. The most innovative developers are always trying to push the limits of the hardware to create great computing experiences. To review in the last Chip Wars episode, we learned how Federico Fagin designed the first general purpose microprocessor. The microprocessor enabled the PC revolution. At its core, all computers just take information that is input to memory manipulates it before outputting it back to the user through a screen. By inventing the microprocessor, Intel mobilized the PC revolution. But today, power has shifted as Apple, ARM, and Qualcomm are shrinking compute down into smaller and smaller devices that fit in our pockets and now go on our wrists. All of Apple's computing platforms have been built on standardized, outsourced hardware that allows developers to create unified computing experiences. But four years ago, Apple made a huge move by designing its own chip architecture, in effect, designing its own hardware. Today, Apple is one of the largest fabless semiconductor companies in the world. They design the chips and outsource the manufacturing to other fabs. With the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, Apple is clearly focused on energy efficiency while maintaining a certain level of performance and also adding in a few features as well. Let's dig into it. Last year, Apple introduced the first mobile 64-bit chip, the A7. And let me tell you, this announcement caught the entire mobile chip industry by surprise. Not only was Apple the first to market with 64-bit hardware, but it even redesigned iOS 7 to take advantage of the new 64-bit architectures and features. And even though today few apps are optimized for 64-bit, given that Apple will probably sell 100 million iOS devices during this holiday season, the company's hardware deserves more in-depth coverage. And if we compare the iPhone to past computing platforms, it's evident that the iPhone is poised to become the largest integrated computing platform in the world. So let's start picking apart the CPU, the GPU, the memory, and the other chips inside Apple's new iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. First, the CPUs. While Apple claims a 25% performance boost over the previous generation, there are some limitations that may become more apparent over time. For sure, according to Geekbench, the A8 processor has the best single-threaded performance out of all the mobile chips out there today. And I'm sure we'll see more and more developers taking advantage of the new cleaner 64-bit architecture that offers more registers and more memory to work with overall. And the really good thing about this transition is that all existing 32-bit apps will still be compatible, they just just won't get the performance boost that 64-bit offers. But where the A8 may start to see some challenges is when it comes to multi-threaded processes, especially with the limitations of the one gigabyte of RAM that's stacked onto the chip. Whenever you run more multi-threaded processes, you really should have more memory to handle the extra bandwidth. So most of the performance boost in the A8 comes from its 64-bit architecture and its ability to compute more instructions per clock cycle. It seems the L3 cache may be the same for megabytes, but there may be a bump up in L2 and L1 cache that helps achieve this performance boost. There's always a performance boost when a processor fetches data from on the die itself rather than having to go off die into the separate RAM. And speaking of RAM, the one gigabyte of LDDR3 1600 stacked on top of the processor processor will probably be the biggest limitation of the iPhone 6 over the next couple years. Second, the GPU. For iOS, graphics performance has always been extremely important. Even though the PowerVR GPU has the same 4-core cluster, Apple is able to claim a 50% performance boost because of some optimizations. The new GPU has better geometry compression, reducing the bandwidth needed to shuffle geometry data back and forth. And it supports adaptive scalable texture compression, a more optimized way to store texture maps for 3D graphics. In the same way that DirectX supports S3 texture compression in PCs, ASTC hopes to be the new standard for mobile devices. Not only does it give game designers a wider range of inputs and compression ratios, but it really gives them the flexibility to choose to optimize for storage, optimize for graphics, or optimize for app performance, uh, hopefully resulting in better games that we'll see on mobile devices. And now that ASTC is officially supported in the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, we'll see more and more developers jump on board in promoting this new open standard. But at the September keynote event, Apple really emphasized two points about the new A8 chip energy efficiency, and its lack of performance throttling. 
By shifting from a 28 to a 20 nanometer process in the A8, Apple was able to achieve some huge energy efficiency gains, extending battery life while maintaining a certain level of performance. So not only did Apple double the transistor count to 2 billion transistors, which is really remarkable in itself given that Haswell has about 1.4 billion, the A8 is 50% more energy efficient compared to the A7, other things being equal. And with respect to performance throttling, Apple addressed an issue that occurs on many mobile devices today. Most modern chips today do something called throttling, bringing the clock speed down to prevent overheating. For example, the Snapdragon 800 will hit 2.3 gigahertz, but only for 20 seconds before bringing the clock speed dramatically lower. But Apple's new A8 is able to hit 1.4 gigahertz for one minute before throttling back down. And Apple may have used its extra die space to add more features like better hardware video-based decoding and its image signal processor to speed up autofocus, blink, and face detection for the cameras. And let's briefly go over the other chips included in the iPhone 6, like its new NFC chip, which is actually locked down to Apple Pay and not open to third-party developers. Also, Apple updated its sensors. By adding two accelerometers, the device should be more accurate in doing things like counting steps and offering quicker image stabilization. Also, the new barometric sensor measures atmospheric pressure to more accurately gauge whether you're going up and down flights of stairs. And when it comes to camera sensors, Apple clearly values better low-light sensitivity over adding more megapixels. The Sony sensor on the rear EyeSight camera appears to be the same CMOS backside illuminated sensor in the iPhone 5S, with the exception of new phase detection pixels. When it comes to autofocus, most smartphone cameras today do something called contrast detection. By boosting the contrast between nearby pixels, the camera is able to determine what should be in focus. But this slower technology performs really poorly in low-lit areas. Phase detection, on the other hand, was introduced in the Galaxy S5. By splitting the image into pairs and then analyzing the differences, it's much quicker and more reliable than contrast detection used in phones today. On the downside, Apple is lagging behind many of the flagship Android phones that will be introducing 4K video this year. So the main advantages of the iPhone 6 hardware focus on energy efficiency with things like power gating and a more diverse chip architecture, better graphics performance from things like better texture and geometric compression, and also camera support that really focuses is on low light performance and better image stabilization. But there are some disadvantages. As iOS moves into 64-bit territory and more complex software, the one gigabyte of RAM and the lack of multi-threaded support may begin to show its age as time goes on. So thank you guys for watching this episode of Chip Wars. Uh, I would encourage you to check out the links below where I got a lot of my sources because there's a lot of great material out there. And as more information comes out, I'll be sure to update the series. So I really appreciate all your feedback, the comments. Uh, I take them into account, especially as I develop new videos. And thank you guys especially for watching these videos as we continue to learn which technologies will fit best in our lives in the future.